Welcome to the video manual for Minecraft Portal Dash, the cooperative Minecraft strategy game for 1 to 4 players aged 10 and up. Object of the game In Minecraft Portal Dash, you try to escape from the fiery nether dimension together. To do this, you have to cross the map and reach the portal, which is hidden under the last part of the map. Before you're allowed to uncover this, you have to complete three pigling quests by putting blocks on the corresponding board. Last but not least, you'll need to beat a final boss. This super strong monster guards the portal. Everybody wins the game once the final boss's health reaches zero. But watch out, you'll all lose the game immediately if one of you runs out of health. You'll also lose if you do not complete the pigling quests in time or if your supply of blocks completely runs out. This will be explained later. Playing materials and setup Minecraft Portal Dash's game system has several levels and lots of variation. You only ever need to use part of the materials to play. In this video, we will explain level 1. In the manual, you can find explanations about the other levels. The game's map contains eight square parts, as well as a starting strip and a portal strip. For level 1, choose two random parts of the map and place them face down side by side. Put the starting strip on the left side and the portal strip on the right, leaving them all face down. Make sure that all parts are aligned the same way. Turn over the first square part of the map. To the side of this, build the resource cube. To do this, assemble the four-part mold and put it on top of the block foundation. Then pour in the 64 wooden blocks and shake it a bit until it forms a big cube. Lift the mold by its tabs and put it down next to the cube. You'll use this to collect blocks used up during the game. Put the piglin board next to it. The number of players will determine whether you have to put the board on the 3 to 4 person side or the 1 to 2 person side. Then it's time for the monsters. For level 1, you only need 10 monster figure cards, 3 magma cubes, 3 ghasts, 3 endermen, and your final boss, the wildfire. You'll also need the final boss board. Turn it onto the plain side marked with a sword and put it next to the portal strip. Next, put the wildfire itself on top of it. Then put one of the pixel hearts on square 20 of the wildfire's health bar. Back to the other monsters. Take a random magma cube and put it on the first part of the map on the spawner square marked number 1. Put a random ghast on spawner number 2 and an enderman on number 3. Put the spawner marker next to the map. Arrange the remaining monsters into a random line behind the marker. Their position doesn't matter. If the part of the map you drew has a spawner square marked with the number 4, take the monster at the front of the line and place it on the spawner square. At the front of the line means the monster next in line to the spawner marker. Now it's time for your equipment. Take an inventory board each and five accompanying object cards of the same colour. You'll also need a character. This is made up of a stand and a player skin of your choice. Put your characters on any given squares on the starting strip. You can decide their precise positions after you've learned all the rules. Fan out your five items and put them in the upper row of your inventory. It doesn't matter what order the items go in. 
Lastly, take seven hearts. Use six of them to fill up your health bar and put the seventh on your leather armor. Over the course of the game, you'll collect additional objects. Look for the eight netherite items with dark faces among the cards. Keep these at the ready as an open inventory. Shuffle all the other items with white faces and put them face down in a pile. Almost there! Now, only the treasure chest markers and the rest of the hearts and dice remain. Keep these at the ready for general use. Put a treasure chest on the map on the square marked with a little treasure chest. Sequence of turns Decide amongst yourselves who starts and then go round clockwise. The player whose turn it is takes the two white dice. Roll these dice at the start of your turn and pay attention to the results. One die removes blocks from play and the other activates monsters on the map. The block die Starts with the block die. If it shows a colour, such as grey in this instance, then you have to take a block of this colour from the resource cube and throw it in the mould. Note the following rules when doing this. You may only take blocks with no other blocks on top of them and which are unobstructed on at least two additional sides. On the first turn, this will be only the four corners on the top layer, but as the game progresses, more and more blocks will become available. If multiple blocks of the colour you rolled are available, then you can choose which you want to remove. However, the block has to be taken from the highest possible point, i.e. the highest layer containing an available block. If you roll a question mark on the block die, then you also have to take a block from the highest layer, though in this case, you can choose which colour you want. In this case, the block you choose still has to be unobstructed, of course. If you roll a colour that isn't available, then you're in luck and don't have to discard a block. The Monster Die Next comes the Monster Die. Check what number you've rolled and look at all the monsters' figure cards on the map. All monsters with the same number will be activated, meaning they will move towards you and try to attack you. If a monster's activated, in this case a magma cube, then it will perform all actions listed beneath its image, always going from left to right. The number in front of the arrow indicates how many squares this monster can traverse. Monsters move towards you constantly and always try to take the shortest route to the nearest character in order to attack them. Find the shortest distance and move the monster square by square to the nearest character. When doing this, the following rules will apply. Monsters can only move onto empty squares with no other character standing on them. Apart from in a few exceptional cases, they also can't move onto lava squares, but will rather try and find a way round. They can turn corners when moving, but never move diagonally. If a monster is standing next to a character, then it remains where it is and begins to attack, even if it would have been able to move additional steps. A monster attack is easily dealt with. The negative number in front of the heart indicates how much damage the monster inflicts on the player if it successfully reaches a character, in this case, on an adjacent square. The affected player then has to give up the number of hearts indicated by the negative number. If more than one character is standing on the same square, or if the monster is adjacent to multiple characters, then you decide amongst yourselves who loses the hearts. However, you may not divide the damage among yourselves. You always remove hearts from your armor first, and then the remainder from your health bar. Remember, as soon as one of you loses the last heart in their health bar, everyone loses the game immediately. Apply this process to all monsters who match the number rolled. The order they go in is up to you. Next up is the Floating Ghast. Its orange arrow means it can even move over lava. Another of the Ghast's unique attributes is the fact that it can attack you from a distance. The little number after the heart shows that it can even attack you from up to two squares away. In this example, he successfully attacks the green player and inflicts two damage. The third monster has a different number and isn't activated this turn. 
If you roll a number that isn't shared by any of the monsters, then a new monster will appear. In this case, take the monster at the front of the line and put it on a vacant spawner square nearest the player that made the roll. If all spawner squares are occupied by monsters or characters, then you are in luck and no monster will appear. Make sure not to activate a newly appeared monster. In each turn, either a new monster can appear or an already present one can be activated, but not both at the same time. Your actions. Now it's your move. In each turn, you perform precisely two actions. For the most part, you use your items for this, but there are also basic actions you can resort to that will be explained later. First, put the two white dice on the left squares of your inventory. Every time you perform an action, move a die to the right side. This helps you keep track of how many actions you've already performed during your turn. You may use precisely one of your items for each action. If you do this, the item will become damaged. You indicate this by moving it onto the bottom row of your inventory. Then you'll not be able to use these items again until you repair them. This will be explained later. You can find out an item's capabilities by reading the symbols. At the start of the game, you all have the same five items, which will now be explained in turn. Boots Boots allow you to move. This works in a similar way to the monsters. You can traverse a certain number of squares as indicated by the number on your boots. The leather boots allow you to traverse up to two squares. Players are also not allowed to move diagonally, tread on lava, or move into squares occupied by a monster. However, you are allowed to share squares occupied by other players. Bear in mind that as well as lava, there are other obstacles lying in wait on the maps. If you tread on a magma square, you will take damage and have to forfeit a heart. This applies, of course, all over again to every additional magma square encountered. Many parts of the map also contain soul sand. Treading on these squares costs two movement points per square. In your leather boots, you'll only be able to move a single square further, and for the next square, you will then need two steps again. Armor Armor gives you additional health points. However, you can't use it actively. You have to forfeit hearts every time you take damage. For example, because a monster attacks you, or you tread on a magma square. Always take hearts from your armor first. How you divide hits between your items of armor is up to you. Once your armor has run out, it counts as damaged and you move it onto the bottom row. Sword and bow. Swords and bows allow you to attack monsters. Swords help you in hand-to-hand -hand combat. To do this, you have to be adjacent to a monster. Bows, on the other hand, have a range of up to three squares. Just like when you're moving, you count the distance. Then you throw the number of black combat dice specified on the sword or bow. When attacking, you can only win if you roll as much damage as the monster has health. One, two, the ghast has two health. In this example, that's enough. If you roll less damage, nothing more happens. Your action is spent and your weapon is damaged. The monster remains standing and on your next attempt, you will need to roll the full number of damage points. In other words, the monster's health points all over again. Defeated monsters, on the other hand, are removed from the map and placed at the back of the monster line. You also receive a reward for each monster you defeat. Always take the top two cards from the item pile and turn them face up. You may now choose which one of these items you would like to receive. Put your chosen item in a free column of your inventory and discard the other one. If you already have six items, you'll have to swap it for an old one, as you can't carry any more. Important, new items always go in the top row of your inventory and become ready to use immediately. You can also swap old and damaged items instead of repairing them. What's more, you can specialize in certain types of items. You're allowed, for example, to carry multiple pair of boots or to replace weapons with armor and so on. However, it's not a bad idea to hold at least one of each type of item. In the item pile, there are also special things to be found, such as trousers that can aid you with movement or serve as armor. 
and enchantments that upgrade your items. If you uncover one of these items, look it up in the manual. Finally, here's another tip on fighting monsters. Flying ghasts can't be attacked with swords, while nimble endermen, on the other hand, can't be attacked with bows. Note the symbols on the monster's figure cards before attacking. Pickaxe You can mine blocks from the resource cube using a pickaxe. The number on the card indicates how many blocks you're allowed to take. The rules for this are similar to what was described for the block cube earlier. In this case, you can also only mine blocks with three unobstructed sides, from above, plus two others. You are, however, allowed to dig directly downwards provided the blocks are available. First, take as many blocks as you're able and wish to mine. You must then decide what you want to do with them immediately, as it's not possible to store blocks in this game. One option is to put the blocks onto the piglin board. You have to fill this up over the course of the game in order to win. To do this, you need to put a block in each square and follow one rule. Each column must contain blocks of only one colour. You can decide yourselves which colours these are. If you arrange your blocks like this, for example, then you've established that these squares can also only be filled with grey blocks later and these ones with red blocks. As shown in the example, you can store blocks anywhere at any time. You don't have to complete one column after another or start from the left. These letters still play a role, of course. No doubt you remember that the pigling quests need to be completed in time. More specifically, all squares of part A need to be filled before the last block of the top layer of the cube is removed. You need to fill in part B before the second layer runs out and part C before the third layer runs out. If you don't manage this or if the fourth layer is removed in its entirety, then you've lost the game. Back to the matter of blocks that have been mined. You can decide whether to put each block on the piglin board or whether to spend it in order to make use of the function of its colour. Spend simply means throwing the block into the mould, basically the rubbish bin. Each colour has its own function in this process. A red block allows you to heal yourself or a team member. The player of your choice then refills all of the hearts in their health bar, though not their armour. A grey block repairs items, more specifically all items held by a player of your choice, including yourself. The player then moves all damaged items back into the top row. If armour is repaired as part of this, then it will be refilled with hearts. If a piece of armour is still in the top row, you may still replenish its hearts as part of the repair. If you spend a yellow block, somebody will receive a new item. Choose yourself or a team member. The player may uncover two items and keep one of them, just like when defeating a monster. As well as defeating monsters and spending yellow blocks, there's a third way to get new items. If a player moves onto a square of the map with a treasure chest on it and remains there, they can open this chest. To do this, remove the chest's card from the map. Each player around the table may now draw two items straight away and, as usual, keep one of them. Returning to the matter of blocks, the rare black blocks bring powerful netherite items into play. If you spend a black block, you may choose one of the available netherite cards. Shuffle this into the top five items from the pile. Then put these six cards back onto the top of the pile. In this way, you don't get the netherite item straight away, but now it's in the pile. Moreover, if the pile runs out at any point, then shuffle all the cards from the discard pile and make a new one. Finally, there are the brown blocks. If you spend one of these, in this case, it doesn't go into the rubbish. Instead, put it on the map. This allows you to cover an empty square of your choice, containing lava, magma or soul sand. This way the square loses its special characteristics. You can then move your characters onto it as normal and in this way create bridges over large lava fields, for example. But watch out, 
monsters will now also be able to step onto these squares. You can find a reminder of the block functions on the included help card. Another help card gives a brief overview of the special items. Basic actions. If you're unable or unwilling to use and damage any items during your turn, then you can resort to a basic action at any time. These are depicted on your inventory board. Action 1 allows you to mine precisely one block, as if with a pickaxe. Of course, you also have to choose whether to put this on the piglin board or spend its function straight away. Action 2 allows you to move precisely one step. But watch out, in Soul Sand Squares you need two steps, and so boots are an absolute must. Action 3 allows you to repair precisely one of your own items. In this way, it's like a weaker version of a grey block. You're also allowed to perform only basic actions in a turn. You can even do the same one twice if you want. Final Boss Phew, that was a lot of rules, but there's just one last thing. How do you actually win? By beating the final boss. It's waiting for you on the final strip of the map. Every time you move on to the next turn and pass the white dice to the next player, you may check whether you would like to uncover the next part of the map, on the condition that one player is on a square adjacent to it. If they are, then turn the board over so that the direction of the landscape remains the same. Then put a chest on the chest square and position the monsters straight away. You'll have to fill all spawner squares in ascending order. If you have successfully crossed all parts of the map in spite of the hordes of monsters and completed all the pigling quests, then you may uncover the portal strip in the same way. There are no additional monsters awaiting you here, only the final boss. Put the final boss on the portal square when you uncover it. As you can see, the final boss bears all three numbers of the monster die. It will therefore be activated in each individual turn and attack you relentlessly. Remember to activate all other monsters with the number rolled as well. You can read how the final boss attacks you on its board. The wildfire awaiting you in level 1 moves constantly up to two steps at a time and can even fly over lava. Then it hurls a fireball at a character from a distance of up to three squares away. The damage inflicted depends on the number rolled, 1, 2 or 3. In this example, the wildfire doesn't have to move, but can reach the green player from its position and inflict damage. Then, it's your move again. To defeat the final boss, you need to attack it with your swords and bows in the same way as any other monster. Luckily, however, you don't need to roll all 20 of its health points in one go. Rather, the damage you inflict all adds up a little at a time, and is taken off by moving the heart lower down on the boss's health bar. Once the boss's health reaches zero, nothing more is stopping you from fleeing through the portal, at which point you've won Minecraft Portal Dash. In the printed instructions, you'll find additional details about the individual game components, example turns, and a monster glossary. Once you've beaten level one, you can play other harder levels or even create your own. We hope you have fun playing this varied and exciting strategy game. Thank you.